Hello and welcome to Third Degree. For nine terrible months in 2005, the man who became known as the Jesus Killer terrorized the community of Philippi near Cape Town, killing and raping. Initially, police refused to acknowledge that a serial killer was on the loose, but the evidence mounted up and finally one man, Jimmy Maketa, pleaded to an astonishing 16 murders and 18 rapes. Producer Megan Robinheim follows the grisly trail of bodies. This is Philippi, a picturesque farming community on the outskirts of Cape Town, South Africa. This is also one of the city's poorest areas. Little infrastructure, no running water or electricity. It is also here where workers live and survive on a minimum wage. Escaping the harsh reality through alcohol is a pastime. Philippi is very well hidden from the rest of the city. So well hidden that when bodies of farm workers started appearing in the irrigation dams, nobody realized the horror about to unfold. Bonnie Swartz lives and works on a flower farm with her husband. It was an innocent stroll to the shops one evening that nearly cost her her life. And I sit langs bijna, and I sit at the club in his hand. Bonnie tried to escape, but she was knocked unconscious with a rock. Trek alles van mij uit. Maak hem in vast bij die boom. Hij heeft me hier vier keer gereed. Ik is, ik is dood. Nee, ze is dood. Left for dead, Bonnie lay motionless in the bushes. It was hours before someone found her. Elsie Jarvis is still haunted by the night a stranger stalked her. She clearly remembers how, whilst walking home with her children and her boyfriend, someone was following. When they arrived home, her mother was not there. Panic set in. A frantic search began. Mother's Day, and still no sign of Elsabi's mother. My clonk in the tree for an attack into a tiger hole to Obana, who can't. I said to Polani. Bonnie 
They dragged the body out of the water. Elsebi's worst nightmare had come true. It was her mother, Mina Jarvis. She had been raped and strangled. Her naked body dumped in the irrigation dam, left to rot. I had a lot of strength to pull in this up, but I couldn't do it. 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 It was the third body to have been found in a space of just weeks. The grisly murders continued into the winter months. By the end of July 2005, a total of six bodies had been recovered from several dams around Philippi. This time, bodies of men were also being discovered. They had been hacked to death with an axe. He almost always chose a man and a woman who were together. And he'd kill the man, rape the woman, and then kill her as well. So it was not that he was looking for single females walking along somewhere or finding themselves alone at home. He would search out the couples. There was never a pattern that not everyone will be killed execution style. He I think he just looked at the situation and did what he had to do with the intention to kill. On some scenes where I myself come, me and my community workers, it was very bad. They was beaten dead with the hammers. They were killed with big poles, eggs. There was murder, there was rape. Four women's lives were spared, but they were left to live with the nightmare. Only the image of the man who raped them was left imprinted on their minds. Identified by the engraved charcoal wording on his forehead. The word Jesus. He wanted us to know, but by doing that and, and being known as Jesus, that he's completely and utterly in control. After the break, police deny there is a serial killer at large. Two months of relative calm was shattered. This time, Mina Manuel would be his next victim. She and her husband Lucas were asleep when their door was kicked in. Lucas was dragged outside. Mina repeatedly raped. In pain and terrified, Mina waited for sunrise to find her husband. She found his body next to a dam. Their neighbor was lying alongside him. Both of them grotesquely mutilated with an ax. Mina Manuel disputed the claim that her attacker worked alone. In her statement to the police, she claimed two other men carried her husband out of the house and killed him. For the two sticks that in the camera there stand, the father had to be for him eight. And to play with Jesus by me. And he said, I climb now for me up. And I can't even ask for play, I can't even ask for play. I can't even ask for play, I can't even do it, I can't even ask. The body count continued to grow. 
by October, eight people had been killed, another six women raped. A string of grisly murders has sparked fears of a serial killer on the outskirts of Cape Town. The hunting ground of a serial killer. These people think so, and they're terrified. In the past six months, mutilated bodies have been found in dams in the area. The Jesus killer was making national news. Police continued to deny this was the work of just one killer. At the moment, we are investigating each murder on its own merits. The police were being accused of dragging their feet, of a sloppy investigation. Vital evidence had been left behind at some of the crime scenes. Many victims were not interviewed, and police avoided all media attention. There's someone who has identified himself so that people know that I am, I want to be known as the Jesus killer. I mean, are you just ignoring that? Are you just ignoring the fact that it's in your face? Not only was he wreaking havoc in the neighborhood, the Jesus killer began toying with local police. He began taunting them with letters. He left maps, describing where his next victim could be found. And there were also messages for those to come. After two or three days, when they had not yet discovered the body, he wrote a letter with a little plan attached to it, a sketch plan of where her body was, which he then left on the stoop of a friend's house. Warning people actually heightens their fear because there's something to worry about. It also heightens the fear of other people because it, it, it shows that people are being chosen and stalked. It creates the presence, your presence, in other people's minds on a regular basis. She also phoned the police on several instances, um, telling them of another body or of that body lying there, they have to go look there. Never identifying himself, of course. A breakthrough at last in the hunt for a suspected serial killer in Cape Town. As media pressure mounts, police begin the long-awaited search. An arrest is made, a 49-year-old man taken into custody. Stanley Martins had previous brushes with the law. Police find him walking alone in the bush and they need closure. The murder is solved, or is it? We are happy that we've got our suspect and we are convinced that we've got the right person. A picture of Martins is shown to survivors but no one agrees. This cannot be the right man. At Martin's first court appearance, it emerged police failed to link him to any of the crimes. Martin's was released, his image forever tainted. He has been branded the Jesus killer. After the break, a breakthrough, a cell phone at the crime scene leads to an arrest. It's been nine months. 
the farming community of Philippi has been gripped by a nightmare. 14 people have been murdered, 22 women raped. No one is safe. Finally, the break police are looking for. At one of the crime scenes, a cell phone is left behind. Whilst scrolling through the numbers, police find one which leads them to Khrabo, not far from Philippi. The telephone number belongs to a boy known as Daryl. What they don't know is that this is the killer's son. I always have children who are in contact with my children and my children. I always have a lot of sense of it. That's how the police are going to take it. Police track down and arrest 41-year-old Jimmy Maketa, a local painter who was living in the bushes around Philippi. Maketa was out on parole at the time for attempted murder. He denied everything. A tough case to crack with very little evidence. Then everything changed. Jimmy Maketa wrote a letter to the investigating officer, Captain Morris. In the letter that he wrote to Captain Morris, he also attached a very detailed sketch plan of the area where the last incidences occurred. He indicated where his little house was, where the houses of some of his victims were, where the dam was, where he threw some of his victims, the roads that they took. The letter revealed a chilling and deeply troubled man. When I dragged her deeper into the bushes, I told her that I wanted to kill her. She asked me why. I told her that sometimes I become like a lion or a tiger. I just want to tear and kill what comes in front of me. She thought I was joking. The accused said that he had the sense of a demon inside him, that it, he was, was like a lion, and that he felt like a lion and the people were like a sheep. Jimmy Maketa spent most of his life here, in Khrabo. I was very lucky with Jimmy. I had him to keep on. So I was very, very lucky with Jimmy. Janetta married Jimmy Maketa in the mid 80s. They have three children. I was very lucky with her. I thought I met her at the doctor's. We seen her see very clear for me. He had me by a hand, so I could see by a slant. Two, two, three, I would make up for slana. Yes, I would make a stick to make up. Two, I would make a slant with a boomstone, powder, and that is a knee on my break of slant. When Jimmy Maketa started having an affair, it was the last straw. Janetta left him and banned him from coming to the house. She divorced him and forbade him from ever seeing his children again. He lacked the ability to perceive the emotions in others that were appropriate, and he didn't really care. And that is the central tenet of what made Mr. Maketa different from other people. The charges against Jimmy Maketa were mounting another 50 charges were put to Maketa. And then a final blow to Maketa's defense team. I discovered again Captain Morris received another letter and then they placed on record again. This letter contained details of another three murders that took place in his hometown of Khrabo in the late 1990s, nearly five years prior to the Philippi killing spree. Now the state's case was solid. The letters sealed his fate. DNA evidence links Maketa to most of the crimes. 
Eyewitnesses positively ID'd him. Maketa pleaded guilty to 46 charges, 18 of rape, 16 murders, six house breakings, two robberies, two attempted murders, and two assaults. Under South African law, Jimmy Maketa proved to be a dangerous criminal, and if given the chance, he would commit the same crimes again. He has to serve 25 years. There's no parole, there's no amnesty, nothing. And in a final chilling blow, Maketa wrote one last letter. It was addressed to his ex-wife, Janetta, blaming her for everything that he did. Netta, the time when you left me, I was in and out of prison. That is when the sickness was taking over me like a lion or a tiger. It grew inside me. From the time when you left me, I started hating men and women. And just before he was arrested in December, Maketa paid Janetta one last visit. Well, that fascinating documentary was a shortened version of a Cinder Time Investments production. That is it for this week. Do send us your comments, those details on your screen. There are plenty of ways to keep in touch. Fax us or email us, Twitter, blog, Facebook. They are all available for you to reach us and share your views. We're interested in hearing them. And do join us again next time for more provocative journalism. Until then, goodbye.